I guess you're waiting for something to happen. I could have just sat down and made you guys stare at the stage. <laughs> uh, good morning. How is everyone today? Good. Our God is good, is he not? Can you say that a little louder? The masks are kind of blocking the sound. Every day. Amen. He is good. I'm supposed to make an announcement. Uh, my husband reminded me to remind you that if there are weeks where you want to sit out in your car for whatever reason, I think it's 87.9. We said it over and over again during the summer, but just in case you guys needed to be reminded or invite somebody who might sit out in their car, 87.9 is the station that you can turn into for that. Let's pray. God, I just thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you that we can still gather here together. God, I pray that you would just help us to pour our praise out before you, that you would help us to lay down our burdens, lay aside our pride, remember that we are forgiven and free. Lord, I pray that we would make a joyful noise before you today and that we would walk away knowing you better and loving others more. In your name we pray, amen. You all can stand, if you'd like, as we sing together. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the king of yeah, you were, yeah, you were, and now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out, we join them as we sing glory to God.
are times where sometimes it's really hard to remember the faithfulness of God when you're in the midst of adversity. And sometimes it's really hard to praise him when you're in that place too. And I had this song kind of playing in my head this morning that talks about his faithfulness. I just want to read these words to you. I'm holding on to faith because I know you'll make a way. I don't always understand. I don't always get to see, but I will believe. I will believe because you make mountains move. You make giants fall. You use songs of praise to shake prison walls. And I will speak to my fear, I will preach to my doubt, that you were faithful then, you'll be faithful now. Like I said, it's hard to remember, but that's what I love about music, is it just kinda, at least for me, sinks down in deep stuff that maybe I heard back in college that made a difference in my life that all of a sudden just gets surfaced back up. Same thing with his word, it gets surfaced back up to remind us there's a reason God repeats himself over and over and over again in scripture. And it's because we forget so easily. So let us remember today the times that he has been faithful. If you're struggling with something, pour out the praise, pour out the pain, and let him lift you up. Let's sing together. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out Working all things out Oh yes, I will lift you high In the us to trust you through the trial 
pray that you would help us to lift a shout of praise before you for your ever, ever so good to us. Bye. 
This song just reminds me of all the ways that we can see evidence of your goodness in creation. And you say that if we won't cry out, the rocks will. The earth will cry out. So God, I pray that as your treasured possession is the people that you created, the ones that you can call holy because of what Christ did, I pray that you would help us to cry out before you. Lord, may we lift up your name, for you are worthy. I pray that as we open your word this morning, that you would make it fall afresh on us, that you would help us to learn something new, that you would speak through your word, and God, again, that you would help us to walk away changed. In your name we pray. Amen. Seated. Well, it's good to see everybody this morning. It is. And uh, there's some downstairs. Shout down there. Wait, do it again. There's like four of them. (laughs) You guys shout to them downstairs. Everybody at home just, you know, you can shout at each other, you know, whatever, and uh, some out in the parking lot are listening over the radio this morning. Just uh, absolutely delighted to have you here. And I didn't catch the announcements that Karma made. Just a couple of things that I want to share with you. We're going to let the kids go so the kids can head on downstairs. And this morning, Miss Wendy isn't going to go downstairs because she's got the privilege of sitting with her a couple of her kids who aren't normal he- normally here. So I think you've already talked to families and parents. So Kids can head downstairs, and uh, yeah. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to resume my 6 a.m. broadcast, so anybody that is either listening online uh, or some of you that are here that are part of that morning crowd, and uh, just want to let you know, we'll begin back at 6 a.m. Studying the Life of Christ, that's on Facebook and YouTube, both. It's a live, interactive uh, time that we do together, and the only face you can see, unfortunately, is mine, And uh, but uh, we, we do have a great time together sharing and praying and laughing and crying and getting a little silly and studying Scripture together, and it's a really, really, really good time, and uh, God has done some great things through that time. So that will resume tomorrow. Uh, I am not going to be doing the Thursday night study this week, though, and uh, just we're take, trying to take advantage of having our kids home, mother home, and uh, so we won't have our Thursday night study, which is the David Jeremiah study that uh, that we've been doing. I want to uh, just ask you, thank you for your patience as all the different work projects have gone on around here, still more to do in the lobby, and uh, we're grateful for the work that Caleb has been doing uh, in, in that regard, and the painting, and different things, and trying to modernize just a little bit, so we're, we're so thankful, but uh, just uh, be patient as you continue to uh, have to step around some paint drops once in a while or some tape still on the floor or uh, just things not quite finished. It takes time to do all these things. And uh, Now, if you're wondering, uh, the, the lights in the lobby, okay, if you're wondering about those big lights hanging over the stairs, the name of those lights are called Sputnik. 
So if you would, I would encourage you to, to tease Caleb about those and say, do you think they have cameras in them? Do you think they have little microphones in them? Because, you know, he's like Sputnik. It's Russian, you know. Uh, anyway, just have some fun with that. I'd encourage you to do that. I would like you to pray with me. And uh, again, we'll look at God's Word. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to open your word, whether we're seated in this room or downstairs or watching from home. It's my prayer that as we navigate through one of the more challenging passages of Scripture, that you would help us to take it to heart. You would help us to have understanding. Help us to not only understand your word, but its application to our lives. So we look to you. Give us the guidance of your spirit, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you have a Bible, I want to encourage you, grab it, whether it's a cellular Bible, a, a electronic Bible, a paper Bible, paper Bible in the pew. We're going to go to two places. So I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, and uh, we're, we're not going to get there for a while uh, this morning, but I want to encourage you to, to turn to Deuteronomy 28. Then also, find the book of Lamentations, uh, chapter uh, 2. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of heads up to find those because Lamentations is one of those really short books that is really hard to miss as you work your way through Scripture. And if you need to use the table of contents in the, uh, be in the beginning of your Bible, go ahead and use the table of contents. Find the page number because we all have different Bibles. Suffering comes in many different forms. Who here has ever suffered? You know, and, and this year, suffering has been magnified. It's been magnified in our limitations. It's been magnified as we, some people have had, had illness. It has been magnified as some people have, have watched loved ones die and not be able to be there with them. You know, and, and we whine and complain a little bit about a mask or something like that. Yet there's real suffering out there that people are going through. And uh, talking to people from international places, what, what we have, our limitations here compared to other places are really nothing. When you can't leave your house at all and... Uh, uh, one person can leave your house on a specific day of the week. And you're going to hear more about that here in a couple weeks. You'll get, get the chance to hear more about that. But we suffer. We've suffered the limitations. We suffer the, the psychological limitations at times, and we can't go to eat where we want to eat, or you can't go to the gym you want to go to, or you can't, you know, different things are closed down, or you go into Belfast to get Chinese food, and the line goes from one end almost all, down to the new pharmacy down to the other end. You know, and we think that's suffering. Uh, for me, the, the, the suffering, watching people go through not being able to be there with their mom as she breathes her last breath. True stories, not just television stuff, real stuff, hard stuff, suffering stuff. Suffering comes in many forms and for many reasons and at times for no apparent reason at all. We'll go, why? Why? Why this suffering? Why, why has this happened? We all, face it, we all suffer at some level. We experience suffering as a result of others sometimes. We, result, we experience suffering as a result of our own failures at times, our own sins, our own bad planning, our own, our own lack of intentionality, our own lack of follow-through our own lack of making a bad decision. We suffer. Suffering isn't just an individual thing. It can be a, a whole corporate thing. A group of people can suffer because of one person. Think of any sports team. That one person that doesn't do their job on a sports team can cause the whole team to lose and to suffer. Think of it in a work setting. That one person not doing their job the right way in a work setting, in a production setting, can foul up everything else and make everybody else look bad. It can cause you to lose business. It has an impact. Our decisions impact other people, even whole nations. And we've been studying the book of 
Lamentations, we understand the suffering that Israel went through as a whole people. And the question that I have asked along the way is, is there suffering that we are going to go through as a people in this country? We're so similar. Now, we're not the same. We can't make a one-to-one correspondence, United States and Israel. We, we can't do that. However, there are principles, I think, that, that we can follow. And as we become more and more and more divided as a country, we're on this precipice that at some point we're going to go over the edge, either internally ourselves or as an act of God. It will come. The Israelites looked at God and said, God, why, why are you doing this? And that's where we're going to go this morning. We're going to look at why God did what he did as we work our way through this book. Today we're going to consider general suffering versus suffering as a result of sin. We're going to talk about individuality and the sense of community and the impact that both have. And last, we talk about how to respond in lament. What is lament? Here's the definition. A prayer that rises to God from a place of human suffering, sorrow, anguish, and loss. Lament isn't just kicking our heels. Lament isn't just whining and complaining. Lament is something that is spiritualized and lifted to God, and we talk to God and say, God, this, this is how I'm feeling about this situation. That is a lament. It is a prayer. But it comes from suffering. And we, we looked last week, we looked the last few weeks about how much lament is actually in the Scripture. And better remember the number in Psalms, what percentage of the Psalms we said are, are Psalms of lament? 40%. Almost one half of the Psalms deal with lament. And, and we would just want to live in, in this happy-go-lucky life. And, and we all do. We want to be happy. We want to be joyful. We, we want to be fulfilled. We want our lives to be meaningful and have an impact and all those things. And yet the reality is they're suffering. And we need to learn how to suffer. We need to learn how to lament. We need to learn how do we cope when things are going bad. Why learning to lament is important. First, because learning to lament causes us to experience God more fully. You know, it isn't just in the happy times. And we, we want the happy. We want the hand raising. We want the clapping. We want the everything is good. But Jesus was called the suffering servant. He suffered. He sorrowed. God sorrowed over the world. Jesus sorrowed over Jerusalem. Jesus demonstrated an immense sorrow before the cross. He was the suffering servant. And so if we want to get to know the heart of God, we, we learn how to come close to God in times of suffering. What we'd rather do is we'll, we'll be close to God when things are happy and, and, and you know, praise him. But the songs that you sang today were such a great setup for the reality of the fact that we need to learn to praise God no matter what's going on. That is God's will for us. Secondly, why learning to lament is important because growth into spiritual maturity requires that we learn to lament. If we're going to be spiritually mature, we have to be able to bring God all the stuff. Not just the good stuff, but the bad stuff. We've got to be able to bring God our own failures, our own faults, our own sins, our own shortcomings, all of it. We need to be able to come before God on behalf of a group of people. We need to be able to come before God in the, on behalf of an entire nation, as the Israelites were challenged to do. Thirdly, failure to lament makes us callous and indifferent. We can become so callous and so indifferent when people go through suffering and pain and heartache and not even care, not even blink an eye. It's just, that's just life. It, it might be interesting for you to know this, but I kind of tend that direction. You got sick? Okay. You're over it? Okay, let's keep going. Somebody died? Oh, okay. It might be interesting for you to know that, but I actually am more like, okay, very pragmatic. Death is a part of life, sickness is a part of life, suffering is a part of life, and yet I have to come back around and think about my own suffering and my own sorrows so that I am not callous towards somebody else going through something like that. The loss of a loved one, the loss of a parent, the loss 
of a sibling or when someone is going through something like cancer. So we think about lamenting, and so we learn how to, to lament so that it helps us be able to show empathy to other people. Now, kind of the big idea here, the big idea is we, that we want to understand the connection between personal and corporate responsibility and the consequences we learn to lament. I mean, we need sometimes to really feel sorrowful as a group of people when we miss the mark. Now, now one of the things that makes the big difference is how we tend to face things here very much so in the West Europe. In fact, I was doing some reading last night or this morning about the coronavirus and, and just the idea that, that uh, the West, particularly the, the Northwest part, Europe and America, perhaps were not as responsive to the coronavirus initially as we could have been. At least that is what one study is saying. And they're saying that is why now we see this mass spread of things. That's what some are saying, okay? The impact upon the whole when a few make the decision. We are very individualistic. The individualism of the West and the communalism of the East. People in the East and in Eastern cultures much more think about coming together. They much more think about the group impact. They much more think about uh, what happens to, to one happens to all. Very, very true. True story. Missionary couples spent many years working with the tribal people trying to get somebody to respond to Christ. And finally, the, the elders of that tribal group said to them, well, we need to have a meeting about what we should do. And the missionaries are thinking about what you should do with what. Well, we need to talk about what we should do with Christ. So the, the tribal leaders got together, and they had a meeting, and they deliberated and talked and discussed and went back and forth. And finally, the chief of the tribe said, okay, we've made a decision. Everybody in our tribe will become followers of Christ. What do you do with that? I mean, we're so individualistic in the United States and the West that it's all about our individual choice. But here in, in that particular situation, the whole group said, now what if you're a person that's saying, I don't want to. We're so individualistic, we're so independent that we, we often miss the fact that there are places in the world that are not nearly as de uh, independent that are so communal in their view of life, in their view of things, and what happens to one happens to all, and they share that all together in something that we need to come back to in our way of thinking. It can be problematic. We don't think about it. When we think about everything being corporate, a danger is this. If it's all communal, if it's all corporate, well, I, I am uh, no longer responsible for my personal actions, for my personal thoughts, for my personal uh, attitudes, for my personal sins, because it's the whole group that's, that, that, that is responsible. There's actually a, a theological bent that goes that way. I wonder if either one of our two resident theologians know what it's called. Liberation theology is the theology that basically says because the whole group is responsible, nobody's responsible, or because the oppressor is responsible, the person that was oppressed is no longer responsible. That's how liberation theology works, and we have to be so careful about that type of theology. But here's the other danger. When we think about everything being individual, we don't consider the personal impact on other people. Well, it's my life. I can do what I want to do. How many of us would say, yeah, that's true? That's true. Yet, do we, how often do we think about how our personal choices will, in fact, the whole, will impact the whole group? It does. In fact, the Bible teaches in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that we are called the body of Christ. We are to be together. We, we are to strengthen each other. Now, now you say, no, wait a minute. What about being together in this whole coronavirus? Look at us. We're, we're only a fraction of what we normally have here. That's true. We have people that come together online. We have people right now who are watching out there at home. We have people who come together during the week. We have people who do some small groups and things like that. People come together. But I want to challenge, and this is maybe more for the people at home right now than, than those of you that are here. Are you engaged in relationship? How are you engaged in the body of Christ? 
sitting at home watching the TV screen, watching the computer screen, looking at your tablet, looking at your phone, isn't the same as being engaged with the body of Christ. I want to challenge you. You have a responsibility in the body of Christ to be engaged, whether that responsibility is to be engaged through, through an online group. Every morning, we've got about 30 people who show up Monday through Friday, and, and we interact. It's a great time. Those that interact, did you say we have a good time? It's a good time, and we have a good time with that. I want to encourage you, don't take the break, because we're starting to see this. People say, well, I don't need to be involved in the church. You are called to be involved in the body of Christ. You have a communal responsibility as a Christian to be engaged with the body of Christ. Now, for some, for some people, their answer, their answer is, well, we're all just going to meet together, no limitations. For us as a church, you all know because you're here, we have opted to limit ourselves to 50 people in this room. We've opted to wear masks. We've opted to do those things because we believe biblically, Romans 13, that's the response that we are supposed to take. You also need to know this. There are rumors that go on out there. There were rumors this week that, that we had COVID here. Folks, if we have COVID in this church family, believe me, you will find out, okay? I had a couple people contact. In fact, I had the news, re uh, news reporter contact me this week and said, we heard that. I'm like, well, uh, no, we don't have it here. We've had one person that we know of that, that has been involved in our church life, but they didn't live here when they had it. In fact, if you remember back several months ago to October, we actually closed the doors and just broadcast that morning. So you need to know, if you hear things out there with people, you say, no, our, our church is trying to be responsible, and if, some, if there's an outbreak or, if, you know, we're, we're trying to do what we think is, is the appropriate thing to do. But I'm going to come back to those folks at home. Watching the TV screen. I don't care if it's me. I don't care if it's Andy Stanley. I don't care if it's Stephen Furtick. I don't care if it's Chuck Swindoll. I don't care if it's David Jeremiah. You are responsible to be involved in the body of Christ in some way. Get involved in a group. Form, take that church at home kit that we make every week and say, hey, I'm going to have a few other people that I get together with anyway and we're going to do church at home, and we'll use that kit. We'll work our way through it. I want to challenge you. You have responsibility in the body of Christ. We are not just individual Christians. Some of you are toes. Some of you are fingers. Some of you are ears. Some of you are mouths. That's me, big mouth. Uh, some of you are eyes. Some of you are feet. Every single person is important. Whether we can all come together or not, I think is secondary to the fact that, that as a Christian, we have responsibility in the broader community of the body of Christ, and, and we can't let that slip. Now, I had you turn to Exodus chapter 20. And the reason, I'm, no, not to Exodus chapter 20. Where do I take us? You stay where you are, Okay. I'm going, to, I'm going to read this passage. Something went out of order here. It says this, You shall not bow down to them, the false gods. Some of it got cut off. Or worship them. There we go. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the, the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, if you see what's going on here in this particular passage, a passage that, that, that makes us think about personal responsibility and corporate responsibility, the sins of the parents, what's it say here? Look at the verse. They, they will experience the consequences of our sins. They will experience the consequences. Our kids will experience the consequences of the bad choices oftentimes that we make. So, so there's a generational where, where we're responsible for more people than just ourselves. But Ezekiel chapter 18 says this, What do you people mean? By quoting this proverb about the land of Israel, the parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. So the idea that the parents do what they do and it affects the kids. 
But the passage continues, As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. Why? For everyone belongs to me. The parent as well as the child, both alike belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. What the scriptures, what what we're looking at between Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, and, and Ezekiel chapter 18, is there are both ramifications personally and corporately. There are ramifications in our own individual lives as well as in our family and then in the broader community. And there's so much in the Old Testament that teaches the ways that, that, that the community suffered as the result of, of leadership failure, the ways that the community uh, suffered as a result of, of failure within the community. What we do impacts other people. There are both communal and personal consequences to what we do. There are three types of relationships. There are natural relationships, and let me define what I mean by natural. Those are inescapable. In other words, you're born to somebody. Somebody had you. You were someone's child. That is that natural relationship that's inescapable. You might want to escape from it, but it's inescapable. Traits of your parents, things, genetics of your parents, all those things, those are inescapable. So that, that, that inescapable natural relationship, the parent-child relationship, the things in the home, the things in the family, the development that we experience, our homes will impact that. That is what we mean when we think about natural relationships. This is by an Italian theologian, Francis Tarrington, who said all this. Then he talked about federal relationships. Now, federal, I think, why do we have to have a word like federal? That's what he used. That's why I'm using it. That's the idea of the, the king's impact upon his servants. You, you could put rulership. You could put government there. Um, that might be another word you could use. But, but the decisions that the leader makes impacts the people. So the federal relationships. Does our government and its decisions it's make impact us? Yeah, it does. Case in point. Decisions. If you couldn't, if you're wondering what that noise was and you couldn't see, I was tapping on my little screen here in front of my face. And then there's voluntary relationships. Those are the relationships where we choose. They're, they're covenantal in relationship. Uh, I, I mean, in, in their um, in nature, we choose to be on a particular sports team. We choose to work in a particular place. We choose uh, to be a part of a church family. We choose to uh, uh, join the military. We make choices. It's, it's a voluntary relationship that we have, but yet it's covenantal. It's willful. It's a choice that we make. Now, John Calvin said this, We are judged individually for our salvation but we're also judged as a covenant people for the impact of our corporate sins on others. So the things that we do, and there is something major that I'm going to get to here in just a moment that we have done in the United States that I think that we need to be able to repent of, and I'll talk about it. And it's going to infuriate some of you, but I don't want to be like the prophets that we're going to read about in this passage. Deuteronomy 28, here we go. Deuteronomy 28 it says this, it says, verse 1, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations on the earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. So here's the question. How many of us in this room would say we want to be blessed? Everybody wants to be blessed. Right here, God says, this is how you will experience blessing if you do the things I want. He goes on in verse 3, you will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, the crops uh, of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds, the lambs of your flocks, your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but then flee. Now, he goes right on down through here and continues to list all the blessings. And I'm like, I, I, I will sign up for that. 
Give me some of that. Where do I sign up for that? God tells us what we have to do. But then when you go down to verse 15, it says, However, if you do not obey the Lord your God, do not carefully follow his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. You will be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. Your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. The fruit of your womb will be cursed. The crops of your hand, the calves of your herds, the lambs of your flocks. You will be cursed when you come in and when you go out. Verse 20, the Lord will send on you curse, uh, curses, confusion, rebuke, and everything you put your hand to until you're destroyed. Now, he's speaking specifically to the Israelites. Okay? Got to bear that in mind. He's speaking specifically to them. He's talking to them and saying, this is, this is what you need to know. and This is what I want you to do and how I want you to live and follow these types of things. And you can compare Deut uh, Leviticus 26 with this passage, but then when you go over to the, the book of Lamentations, chapter 2, verse 17, we see it coming to fruition. It says, the Lord has done what he planned. He has fulfilled his word, which he decreed long ago. He has overthrown you without pity. He has let the enemy gloat over you. He has halted the horn of your foe. He has exalted the horn of your foes. Lamentations chapter 2, verse 17, God is basically saying, look, I told you this all the way back there. I told you this all the way back in Leviticus, all the way back in Deuteronomy, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. This is all you had to do, but yet you couldn't do it. And so now you experience the consequences based on what we read. Now, what are, what are some of the consequences and some of the causes? Here in Lamentations chapter 2, Go to verse 1. And this is, this is heavy sledding. This is not pleasant stuff at all. It says, How the Lord has covered the daughter of Zion with the cloud of his anger. He has hurled down the splendor of Israel from heaven to earth. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. Verse 2, Without pity, the Lord has swallowed up all the dwellings of Jacob. In his wrath, he has torn down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought down her kingdom and its princes down to the ground in dishonor. Verse 3, in fierce anger, he has cut off every horn of Israel. He has withdrawn his right hand at the approach of the enemy. He has burned in Jacob like a flaming fire that consumes everything around it. Like an enemy, he has strung his bow. His right hand is ready like a foe. He has slain all those who were pleasing to the eye. He has poured out his wrath like fire on the tent of the daughter of Zion. The Lord is like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all her palaces and destroyed her strongholds. He has multiplied mourning and lamentation for the daughter of Judah. This doesn't sound pleasant at all, does it? What we want is we want a God who doesn't sound like this. But friends, that isn't God. We want a friend who's just warm and fuzzy. We want a, 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 a God who is just like a marshmallow, you know, just, just soft and tender and sweet all the time. But as you read the Scriptures, that isn't God. God is holy. God is different. God is complete. God is other. And God knows what is best for us. And if we will live in the ways he wants us to, we read already he wants to bless us. But when we choose to go to thumb our nose at God and say, I want to do it my way, then we begin to suffer the consequences as we read here, the consequences that they themselves were experiencing. Verse 6 says, He laid waste his dwelling like a garden. He has destroyed his place of meeting, the temple. The Lord has made Zion forget her appointed festivals and her Sabbaths, and in his fierce anger he has spurned both king and priest. Now, I'm just going to stop there for a moment. Some of the consequences. Here's what was going on. And friends, those of us in America, we need to understand the parallel between America and Israel. I think there is a lot of validity to this. 
that what God brought on them, here's what happened. The Israelites said, we're God's people. God will never do anything bad to us. We're America. Nothing bad can ever happen here. We need to wake up because it can happen. It is happening. It will continue to happen. All the division that we have, all the fighting that we have, divided families that we have. Christian, it's time that you get back to no more excuses about all the COVID and all those things. Are you living for Christ? Are you living for Christ? As you watch me at home, you've got the opportunity right now to hit click and turn it off. But the question is, will you live the life? Will you in, be engaged in the body of Christ globally and what it's doing? To, you know, I have people who will say to me from time to time, when the church gets back, people, we haven't missed a beat. Not one beat have we missed. We have been here every single week. Are you? Are you doing your part? Are you being engaged? Are you? And like I suggested to you, there are other ways you might say, I can't come to the gathering. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you gather with other people? Why not gather for church with those same people in your home? There's things you can do. But we've come to the point in American Christianity where now we're starting to make all kinds of excuses. Someone recently told me, stop making excuses. And I think those are good words. We have to stop making excuses because there's so many out there. Well, somebody ticked me off. Get over it. Forgive. Move on. Let's not let the enemy separate us any longer. Not just us. I'm talking the church because it's all over the place. We're just as divided as the world is. Why? Because we want to be in control of ourselves. We are not in control of ourselves. We are called to be controlled by the Spirit of God. We are controlled to be directed by the Word of God. And so, why did they experience? In fact, let me, let me finish my way down through this passage. Verse 7 says, The Lord has rejected his altar, abandoned his sanctuary. He has given the walls of her palaces into the hands of the enemy. They have raised a shout in the house of the Lord as on the day of an appointed festival. So here's the enemy in the temple shouting and degrading it. All because the people would not do what God had told them to do. Verse 9 says, Her gates have sunk into the ground. Their bars he has broken and destroyed. Her king and her princes are exiled among the nations. The law is no more, and her prophets no longer find visions from the Lord. Now, there's so much. I'm not going to cover all that's in this passage. There's some nasty stuff. I think one of the most challenging verses, perhaps, in all the Scripture is over in verse, verse 20. And I don't think I have that on the screen for you. But look at verse 20. This is how bad it got during the siege of Jerusalem. Verse 20. Look, Lord, and consider. Whom have you ever treated like this? Should women eat their offspring? The children they have cared for should the priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord. Now remember, historically, 586, as Nebuchadnezzar had laid siege to Jerusalem and he was going to starve them out, that's exactly what, what he was doing to them. He was going to make them surrender. No supplies, no food, two years. It got so bad that this is the type of thing that began to happen. Because they failed to repent. They failed to turn. They failed to acknowledge God. And, and when you look at some of the reasons for the consequences, verse 6 told us this. It says, He has laid waste to his dwelling like a garden. He has destroyed the place of his meeting. The Lord has made Zion forget her appointed festival. So here's the thing. They'd already forgotten them. One of the reasons for the consequences is that they forgot to do the things that they were supposed to do. The appointed feasts, the Sabbaths, they, they just threw that all out and said, that doesn't matter, that's not a big deal, that, you know, that, that isn't practical. Yet God told them exactly what he wanted them to do, and they, because they thought it was impractical or they had a better plan than God, 
they would do something different. And so in verse 6, where it's talking about him allowing this destruction on his place of meeting, it's, it's reason was the fact that they had failed in their festivals. They had failed in their Sabbaths. And I, I think a lot of Christians in our day do the same thing. Are we living for Christ or are we living American Christianity? Are we living Western Christianity? I think there are a lot of us that live, live some other version of Christianity than what we read in the Scriptures. If it doesn't cause us to love God more and love other people more, perhaps it's leading us down a wrong road. Because Jesus himself said the law and the prophets hang on these two things, love God and love people. So if it takes us away from that, and if it takes us away from, it takes us to all the politics and takes us to the right and to the left and away from Christ, I want to suggest to you that we're missing the mark that Christ has for us. Verse 7, it says, The Lord has rejected his altar and abandoned his sanctuary. He has given the walls of her palaces into the hands of the enemy, and they've raised a shout. The Lord has rejected his altar and abandoned his sanctuary. Why? Because his people had done that. And we live on the very precipice of that right now in American culture. Roughly one, it's estimated one-third of people used to be part of a church aren't going back. Jesus said this, when I return to the earth, will I find faith on the earth? When I come back to the earth, what will the faith be like? In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 24, in the last days, the love of most will grow. Do you know how it will grow? cold because you guys are sitting here that tells me that your love hasn't maybe gone cold or that your faith hasn't become stale but may, maybe it has and i want to challenge you to if you're christian if you acknowledge jesus christ as your savior to to re-engage to recommit to say, Lord, I'm going to live the real Christian life. Is anybody else here that would say sometimes you live the phony Christian life? Anybody else willing to admit that? Come on. When I say phony, it's like we don't, we don't really go after the things that God wants us to go after. And yet then we wonder why we're weak and why we're anemic and why we're called the consequence that they experienced because it was because they failed to do the things that God wanted them to do. Verse 9. Verse 9, here it talks about her prophets no longer find visions from the Lord. Now, I'm going to get into something here in just a moment that, that for some of you is going to be controversial. Verse 14 says this, The visions of your prophets were false and worthless. They did not expose your sin to ward off your captivity. The prophecies they gave were false and misleading. There have been a lot of false prophecies about Donald J. Trump. I'm sorry. They didn't come true. Now, I'm not saying whether I'm pro-Trump or anti I'm not saying any of that. But here's my take on it, and I really had to wrestle with whether I could or should say this or not, but I'm obligated to God to say this as not a prophet that foretells the future but holds us to the truth. When I look around at our country, the very things that we are experiencing we deserve. The rudeness, the rancor, and all that we saw in the political fold and some of it under the banner of the name of Christ was sinful and we must repent. We think it was okay. Well, it's okay. They, they do this. They do this. They, it doesn't matter what the other side does. We are responsible to live the life of Christ. We are responsible to do the things the Word of God tells us to do. It's not about Republican. It's not about Democratic. It's not about mask. It's not about not mask. It's not about whether the virus is real or not real. It's real, folks. It's about... If we're followers of Christ, that must be the first and primal thing in our lives. There were a lot of false prophets. Now, I was so careful to lead us down the road to not say, this is what's going to happen. God told me this is what's going to happen. 
Now, some people are trying to take cover and go, well, but I still believe the prophets. Why? We need to have our eyes open to the fact that God is calling us as the American church to repentance, that God is calling us to love him first. It isn't about gizmos and gadgets. It isn't about worship services. It's about our individual hearts. Are they yielded to Jesus Christ? And then our corporate heart, our collective heart, are we yielded to Jesus Christ? They experienced what they experienced because they thought they knew better than God and they did things differently. And so we read all these words and there's so much more in this passage. What's Jeremiah calling them to? Jeremiah who wrote this book, what was he calling them to? He was calling them to repent. He was calling them to lament. What is what are four levels? of response in lamentation. I'm going to suggest to you four levels. First, recognition. That we are able to recognize what's going wrong in our world. We're able to recognize what is going on where we have missed the mark. We're able to recognize it. Secondly, remorse. Where we feel bad about it. It's not just enough that, yep, a bunch of people screwed up out there. No. It, it's It's... I feel badly. I, I feel badly. Evangelicalism. How many would say that for much of culture, the word evangelical has become a, almost a swear word? Nope. You guys don't see that? Are you blind? Are you kidding me? I saw like two hands go up. You're out of touch if you don't see how the world out there, how the culture views the word evangelical. It, it is nasty. It is bad. We're lumped in. And if you think, well, we're, if you think we're better, what about Christian? Anybody else see the, the word Christian as being something that has become a derogatory thing? It's like when I travel places. I don't like to tell people I'm a pastor because they think most pastors are idiots. We should have remorse that the church has lost its voice. We should have remorse that we've gotten so caught up in things that aren't Christ. It should break our heart. Remorse is, is, is where it gets into our being, into our soul, and we're feeling so badly. The downward spiral is going to continue until we get a hold of ourselves and look at what's going on. Listen, let me, let me use the word evangelical. I'm not saying it is a bad word. I'm saying culture has made it a bad word. Media has made it a bad word. It's been so aligned with, with, with the right and, and some of the bad stuff with, that all gets blended in together. It gets put into a ninja foodie. <laughs> blended up and mixed up and it all looks the same. I had to throw that in there for somebody's benefit. Chops it all up, mixes it all together, and it, no. Evangelicals should be a good word. Evangelical is a word that means we're about the euangelion. That's the Greek word for the good news. Not about politics, but the good news of Jesus Christ who came to be the Savior of all who will believe. That's what we have to offer. Evangelical is a good word, but it's been so usurped in culture and in media that it's such a hard word to say out there. It's like a swear word. Now, their words oftentimes are swear words to us, but to us, to them, when they hear the word evangelical, it's anathema to them. It's a bad thing to, to so much culture. So we, we have to be careful. How do we position ourselves? Third, repudiation. To repudiate. Where, wherever we're involved, wherever we're engaged, to, to repudiate, to renounce, to turn away from, to say that bad stuff, we need to get back on. Are you more about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the United States of America? I like to think I'm patriotic. 
I like to think that I'm supportive of our military. I like to think that I'm supportive of our police and, and of law and of government and those types of things. And we should be. But as a Christian, our highest calling is the calling of the kingdom of Christ that goes beyond politics, it goes beyond race, it goes beyond gender, it goes beyond all of that stuff and gets to the very soul of man. That is Christianity. A fourth step, repentance. Repentance is to turn away from, to turn away from, to turn to God. We like to turn to our intellect, but you know what an, an evidence of turning to God looks like? Looks like this. A willingness to get down on our knees before God and pray. A willingness to, to publicly even say, I was wrong or we were wrong. That's what repentance can look like. Repentance may have tears. Repentance will have words. Repentance has always followed in actions. Repentance. And that's not something that I developed. I want to credit the person that this, this four levels of response and lament comes from was another contemporary pastor, Kevin DeYoung. But I think it's helpful to frame things in that way for us to understand what it is that we need to do in response. Now, this all sounds negative. And the call that I have for us as Christians, part of Veracity Chapel, whether you're home or here, is where are our hearts in relationship to Christ? The word for America, I think, is the word that's here, and it's not popular. But the fact is, unless we turn back to God, it's going to continue to get worse. And I don't mean the world out there turn to God. I mean us turn to God. That we don't just look Christian, but we are Christian. That we don't just say the things we ought to do, but we do the things we say we ought to do. That we walk the talk. That we make it legit. That we make it real. If you still have your finger tucked into Deuteronomy 28, turn back there, then turn two chapters. There's a promise. The, the reason... The reason that God gives for all of this, a final promise, God wants us to turn to him. Deuteronomy chapter 30 says this, When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you, and you take them to heart wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children, here's the word, Return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul according to everything I command you today. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and he will have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you've been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want the blessing of God? And I guess I did have all those verses there that we, I could have had on the screen for you. I forget sometimes. God wants to bless us. God, God isn't out to, to just stomp on us. God isn't out just to make life miserable. Not at all. God wants to fill us with joy. God wants to fill us with contentment. God wants to fill us with, with, with completion. God wants to fill us with this sense of good relationships. And it comes by working things through. It comes through repentance. It comes by doing things God's way. God wants to be a good God to us. But we have to be responsive to him. We have to be willing to, to say where we failed we have to be willing to, to acknowledge what's important. Here might be an a, a exercise for you this week. What are important non-negotiables in living in the body of Christ? Are there non-negotiables in living in the body of Christ? Now, I've said that to you. I'm going to throw out some to you that I think are non-negotiables. 
corporate worship, worshiping together. I think it's important, whether it's in a group like this or a smaller group, corporate worship. Another thing I want to suggest to you that's important is the corporate opening of God's Word together. Again, whether it's in a large group like this or in a smaller group setting. What else do I think is important? That we learn to pray together as a people. I think that's important. And I have Scripture for all of this. You have to know I have Scripture for all of this. Supporting each other. When there's a need, we meet a need. Supporting each other. Supporting the ministry of the church. Those are some of the things that we do that, that uh, are non-negotiables, in my opinion. It's not just my opinion. I think the Scriptures teach that Acts chapter 2, if you want a place to look, Acts chapter 2, the end of the chapter, you see how they live with each other, and it says God was so pleased that God did incredible things. God added daily to their number those that were being saved. The world looked on them and went, wow, I want what they have. May that be us. God, you're good. Even though what we've looked at here has been challenging and difficult, you gave a promise that if your people would follow in the ways that you want them to follow, you would bless them. You also gave the promise that if your people didn't follow in the ways that you wanted them to, then there would be a curse. Israel in 586 experienced that curse. God, it's our prayer that the United States will not experience that curse. It's our prayer that, that the people who are Christians in the United States will, will, will make it about living for Christ and, and the gospel, loving God and loving people. That, Lord, that we would be able to, to snatch our country back from the edge. Help us to not contribute to the division. And Lord, if there is a division that we bring, may it only be the division that comes through the name of Jesus Christ, that people revile at that name and don't want to hear it. Lord, we know that those days are going to come too. And when they do, help us to be ready. We pray for our country. We pray, remorsefully pray, for where we've gotten to that we need to have fence and barbed wire and National Guard presence in our capital, that we've had all the tumult in all of our cities for months on end. God, we're filled with remorse. Help us in our own personal lives to repudiate that which does not glorify Jesus Christ. Help us to repent of that which does not glorify Jesus Christ as we talk with people in the stores, as we post things on Facebook and social media. Lord, help us to do only that that lifts up Jesus Christ. that which demonstrates the love of God to an onlooking world. Lord, help us to know that when we signed up to follow Christ, we, we laid down our rights. We only have now a responsibility to take up our cross daily to deny ourselves and follow you. May we be willing to do it, Lord. That you again could bless us as a people individually. You could bless our homes. That you could bless our churches. That you could bless our country. Lord, thank you for the promise that you gave. The final word that, that we looked at this morning in Deuteronomy chapter 30 that you want to bless, you want to show your goodness. Help us each in our own hearts and our own minds to be in a place where we can receive your goodness, where we can contribute to your goodness. Lord, if there's anybody that has never really trusted in Christ to be their Savior, that today might be the day they go, okay, this sounds like hard stuff, but I'm in. 
that they would make the decision to follow Christ today. Lord, for brothers and sisters perhaps that have been wrestling with how they will follow you or if they will follow you or pretending that they're following you, Lord, move them off the center, get them off the fence and help them be fully engaged with you, God. All for your glory, all for your honor, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All of you stand as I read this. It's really interesting. Um, I was looking up passages that went with God's faithfulness this week, and Deuteronomy was one of them. Um, Not the particular passage we looked at today, but it talks about obedience. God is faithful to those who obey. This is from Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is faithful, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. And if we jump over to the next chapter, there's a verse that says, Observe the commands of the Lord your God. Walk in his ways and revere, fear him. And I pray that as we have heard these things, for those of us who may be not obedient to what he wants us to do, that doesn't just mean that we're doing things that we shouldn't do. It means that we aren't doing things that we should do. It goes both ways. So I pray that you would allow God to work in your heart and to remind you of the things that he's calling us to do. One other thing is I really recommend, if you're going through Deuteronomy, or really any book, to circle, underline, if you do that in your Bible, um, where it says, the Lord will. The Lord has, because that's pointing to his faithfulness. Sometimes it gets really easy to read the word and only look at it for application for us personally. How does this apply to my life? Yes, that's good, but who is God? Remind yourself of who God is, and you'll be reminded of his faithfulness. So let's sing together. goodness of God. 
Lord, let that be the position of our hearts as we go into this next week. Lord, may we be displays of your goodness to the world around us. God, I pray that you would continue to work in us. Help us to dig into your word, to come before you in prayer for our own personal things that we need to bring before you and repent of, the things that we need to repent for our country and our world. Lord, I pray that you would put a burden on our hearts and remind us of the lost. We know your goodness, so I pray that we would help, you would help us to share your goodness with those around us so that they too can know your faithfulness and the joy that you bring, the peace that you bring, the hope that you bring. I pray that you would just bless us as we go, bless us as we obey you. In your name we pray, amen. Have a great week, everyone.